Well, any other um, uh, landmark uh, issues that, that really come to mind as being either controversial or inspirational or groundbreaking? I'm sure you're proud of them all. Um, but, but any other st um, stand out in your mind? Well, there are articles I went at, and certainly some covers I went at, but um, nothing of the magnitude of the Paul Dunn issues. There were topics that were perennial topics throughout the magazine. And, um, what were some of those? Well, the, the tension between the intellectual and the institutional church. I mean, that was, it had begun before us with the fight over the church historians in the Camelot years. And Sunstone under Peggy, she started and we continued it, uh, a whole series discussing that. And, uh, but then it spilled over into general intellectuals and lots of people got involved in that topic. David Bowen, political science professor at BYU, wrote numerous articles. He started on the history thing and kind of moved into the intellectual thing. And um, of course, people like Paul Toscano would write and speak about it, Michael Quinn, and um, it, it became just a perennial topic. And, um, and, and the emotional pitch of it crescendoed over time as the church disciplines increased, too. Um, but there were a lot of faith-promoting things. I'm really proud of the... Uh, uh, Ed Kimball, the, um, the law professor at BYU and President Kimball's son and biographer, um, was on our board of trustees. He and Bon and Ritchie are good friends. And uh, he was very good. I enjoyed his counsel, which he gave regularly. And, and he actually recruited articles for us of the more faith-promoting nature. He dug up this article on, on Spencer Kimball and the service station guy. As an active Mormon, who President Kimball would patron, patronize his service station and recruit him to be active again. It's quite a little touching story. And then he got us this other article. I don't know if he got us this one, but this guy who wrote about President Kimball, President Benson in his last years. Which I personally thought it was a little zany as, a, as an article, but a lot of people found it very touching and endearing. Um, uh, those were those were fun projects. I don't know if I'm especially more proud of them than anything else, but I, I have a kind of quirky fondness for them in my heart. Um, I liked Our Pillars of Our Faith, which is a perennial favorite, and some very good ones. I really liked Eloise Bell's and Kathleen Flake's. Um, um, any, um, any presentations during the symposiums that stand out as being important or inspirational or controversial, let's say, pre-1993. Any, any, um, anything stand out? Yeah, every symposium has its memorable moments, and there's great stories. I have to get me saying them. I guess the one which, uh, I don't know if Scott talked about this, which, this was in 1989, um, Elder, Elder Oaks had given his talk on alternate voices which was clearly about Sunstone, and uh, maybe not exclusively, but, you know. We, and um, so we had a panel to talk about that, and that was a fiery night. I, I, I moderated the panel, and um, I guess this was 1979, the 10th anniversary of the symposium. Back 89, 89. At, seven, 89, thank you. Back at, the, um, back at the University of Utah. And... I remember that night, I was moderating it, and we had Levina Fielding Anderson on it, and Marie Cornwall, and then um, Larry Young. Was, was Larry Young on it? No, no. Someone else. Who else was it? I can't remember. And Orson Scott Card. And Orson Scott Card was one of the people I was so proud of, too. He'd been an early contributor to Sunstone during the Scott Kenny years. He was prolific, so much so that he... He had four or five articles in one issue that he ghost, ghost wrote under different names because he had so many articles. He even once reviewed his own play under a different name in the magazine. And <laughs> then he dropped off. Uh, but I liked Scott and, um, and really worked hard in getting him to write. And he agreed to be a columnist for the magazine. And he, he chose the name for his column, A Changed Man, meaning he's sort of a born-again mainstream Mormon, whereas he'd been a little liberal before. And he wrote very provocative art columns that offended a lot of people, but a lot of people were damn glad he was in the magazine. Um, so he was on his alternate voices panel. And um, trying to get people to speak 
intelligently about this. And Marie Cornwall spoke and gave this. She's a professor of sociology at BYU. She gave this little speech where at the end she says, and we're just like matches with our kids with our matches in our hand, ready to strike them. And it was not clear what the metaphor was, whether we're going to burn down the church or what, but it was an incendiary metaphor. <laughs> yeah. And then the other BYU faculty member, who was that? I can't remember right now. And Anne Marie, then they realized they may get in trouble for their BYU connection, so like they shut up. So, uh, so I'd have Levina, who would say more provocative things, and Scott Card, who would say provocative things. And I turned to the BYU faculty to kind of give countering things, and because the sociologists are really good at putting things in a context. And they would like just be mum. So we had these two people. And then it turns out Scott Card and Levina had this history when they both worked at the Enzyme years ago where they hated each other. And so we had this little cat fight between them. Now we're just trying to moderate, which is the, and then. Scott Card says something about how he'd been so good friends with Scott Kenny in organizing and founding Sunstone, and uh, but now he's really sad about how Scott Kenny, the journey he'd taken, and um, turns out they hadn't talked in years, and Scott Kenny's in the audience, you know. So and when it's time for audience comments, Scott Kenny comes up and makes this little response to Scott Card. So they're having this thing, and then. Scott Card is keeping saying provocative comments, saying, you guys who don't understand the brethren, and he's trying to defend the church. And Ron Prittis started booing, and people in, in, around him started booing Scott Card. <laughs> and <clears throat> it was a session that just got out of control. That the more moderate voices just shut up because they didn't want to get in trouble with their employer. And uh, later that night, as I was walking Scott Card to the, his car, he says, these are not my people, Elbert. They booed me. They actually booed me. <laughs> I said, oh, it's just Ron Prittis. You have a fight with signature books anyhow over your, your, the book you and Cal Grandal did. And he says, uh, I don't know. These are not my people. I'm not ever going to come again. I said, you know, lots of people like you. And think of the Washington Symposium, which you've come to. He really liked that. He says, well, maybe I'll do the regional symposiums. But he never did anything ever after that, which was sad uh, because... One of the things I really wanted to do when I came to Sunstone was increase a discussion about building Zion, which was a passion of mine at the time. And Daniel Rector supported me in that. And so we organized a theme symposium, maybe the only theme symposium Sunstone's ever had, uh, on Zion. And Scott, we got Scott Card to come out and speak at it. And he so enjoyed that experience. And there were so many BYU faculty and even church employees who spoke at that. That, and some of them got in trouble for doing that afterward. And Scott liked it so much, he, and, but it was not well attended because it was held in Provo. And so we were losing money on it. And Scott put a couple thousand dollars on his American Express to help pay our hotel bill. He was, and so, so I have really high moments with him. And then that totally meltdown at that symposium on the, on the, on the alternate voices. Hmm. Any other hmm. um, funny or inspirational or charged um, symposium presentations worth mentioning that come to mind. No pressure. I'm just that, that was a fun story. So um, yeah, I, there are many. You have to get me going. I can just tell them because there's like there's yeah, all of them. Have. Go for it. Go for it. Um, well, one of the things I introduced at Sunstone was um, for the symposiums. I really wanted to position us as faithful people discussing the church rather than as malcontents, and so I introduced like prayers at the symposiums, opening and closing prayers at the sessions, which it's hard to believe that now, but that was a controversial act. I, mean, I, I don't think I've had more people come up to me in the hallways and criticize me for turning Sunstone into sacrament meeting. And, uh, and at the very first one, where Carolyn Pearson spoke, but why was that a session? She was, she was promoting her book that had just come out on, on the death of her ex-husband from AIDS. Um, what's that book titled? Um, uh, no more goodbye. No, 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 I'm sorry. Uh, goodbye, I love you. Goodbye, I love you. And, um, and she's really quite a self-promoter. You have to admire that and want a single woman now. But Dan had scheduled her for the day and Hugh Nibley to speak that night. And Carolyn insisted that Hugh Nibley be bumped. And uh, so uh, it was put upon me, and I was in Washington at the time, to negotiate that so Hugh wouldn't be so miffed that he would cancel. And we were able to do that. So we had this evening session with Carolyn's Pearson. This was like 1986, I guess. And, um, and it's probably the largest Sunstone Symposium ever, session ever held. It was the ballroom at the, 
at the then the Sheraton, which is now the Hilton, I guess. And, um, and it packed the room to overflowing. And Carolyn speaks. And Marty Bradley, who was a member of the board, was chairing that session. And she was so nervous about introducing the prayers that she, um, at the, she didn't really have a vocabulary or, uh, or presiding style to do it naturally. She, she felt like she was making a dramatic statement. So she just skipped over, into, over the prayers. So we didn't have prayers at that time. But Carolyn speaks. And she is so melodramatic in her speaking style, you know. And the room is just packed with her. There's a huge gay contingent and a huge feminist contingent. And then just people who are interested in Carolyn. I mean, I know there must be... 3,000 people in this room just crammed. And, uh, and she's just so melodramatic. And the high pitch was just... Um, uh, I, I don't know. It's, it's, you just remember that. Nothing, I've never seen a session so high pitched as that. In terms of her voice or in terms of just the tension in the room? In terms of the tenor? tension in the room and the faithful people wanting to hold on Carol, the Carolyn they knew at BYU who wrote all her beautiful poems. And the feminists holding on to the feminist Carolyn and the gays holding on to the gay friendly Carolyn. And it was, and they're not really all getting along. And, uh, but there's no, nothing spoken that was dramatic. But Carolyn's style is so melodramatic. She speaks, she doesn't speak in complete sentences. She's, she speaks in phrase fragments. And then I said to him, and you know, punctuated with these dramatic pauses and sighs and you know, heavy, heavy laden uh, words. Uh, it, it was a, quite an evening. <laughs> um, t talk about Eugene England and your memories of him, uh, both interacting with him and in whatever interaction he may have had with either writing articles or presenting at Sunstone. If you have a story or two. I have a lot of Gene English stories. One of my all-time favorite people and one of the most frustrating people in the world to work with. Because Gene is naive and idealistic. I mean, he really believes that proving contraries, truth will be made, made manifest. And if you get people together, they will talk. And he's tried that so many times. And some, sometimes, and, and they will talk, and if they understand each other, some, 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 something will happen where truth will emerge from the synthesis of them. And that doesn't happen often, or maybe even usually. Often they... If they fully understand the other person, they still disagree and even hate. And, uh, but Gene's always pushing for that naivete. And uh, I would say the worst thing that ever happened to Gene England was the word processor. He, um, he, as he got older, which, and as technology increased, his papers became longer and longer. Any thought he had, any quote, anything, he would just throw in. So they'd become these 80, 90, 100 page papers. And he'd like to give them. And he'd want not only 90 minutes, but two hours to present a paper, you know. And, uh, and then if he couldn't, he'd want to publish the whole thing. And they were just long things. And I remember the California Symposium where he was giving the evening plenary session, a closing one. And, uh, and he spoke for more than two hours. You know, and even his diehard faithfuls were just dead. But every word was important to Gene because he loved ideas and words. But how, the, how could you capture Gene for a new generation that has never even thought of Bruce R. McConkie, let alone Eugene England? How could you tell a new generation his personality or importance to um, our heritage and history is within Mormonism? What did, what did he represent? What did he embody to you? Um, what was his legacy? Um, Gene believed in ideas, and he was more of a cause fighter. I mean, and uh, so he promoted issues that he thought were important. You know, and blacks in the priesthood, which he inherited from his mentor, Lowell Benyon, and, um, and peace issues, particularly peace issues. And so he, he had this genius for presenting things and, that would kind of rally you up to want to care. And he cared so much. And, and he was fantastic. Never was a better person in tit titling his papers, which basically the title tells you everything. You almost need to know why the church is as important as the gospel, why, as is, why the church is as true as the gospel, and um, which was a great call for the importance of community and socializing, socializing in the church. Um, um, but the most important thing about Gene, which really only lives in his generation is his 
enormous, generous spirit. I mean, when he called you, you my friend, you know, you never had a higher honor in the world. And, uh, and he didn't take things personally. If you disagreed with him or, or yell at him for doing something, he n never would a person repent more fast and more genuine and, and uh, want to have love cover everything, uh, all the differences. And uh, he was stubborn, he was sure of his ideas, and he would push them and always challenge these things and, and believed in them. And, and you liked that about him, even though you disagreed with him. Um, and he liked everyone. He wanted to include them all. He was a true Christian person um, who was smart and intelligent and uh, his passion and his care for the ideas. Was, was, uh, he, he was just terrific. If you had to lift up, uh, let's just say three or four more people as important or representative um, for what Sunstone was trying to be while you were working, who are some of the other people that a new generation should come to know through their writings or speeches or, or just their personalities? Do you have even two or three people that you would say that you could describe and maybe tell a story about? Sort of like if there were trading cards, like baseball trading cards for, uh, <laughs> for your Sunstone years, who, who would be on those cards? And, uh, and you know, describe each one. Well, I suppose they're their big names. Um, for the writings and, and the personality is Lowell Benyon. Um, I consider it one of my greatest blessings of Sunstone is to get to know Lowell Benyon. Um, he was very thoughtful in his writings and uh, you know, he had this sociology cha tra training from the 30s and yet he never spoke like he had that training but you can see that sociological perspective coming through all his theology writings and he's he he like Gene um, believed that the outcome was the most important thing what we did and what we thought how we acted um, and he would use his theology to, to push those things a little more honest sometimes in his theology but not completely Lowell would say it's more important to to promote the kind of God that promotes goodness in us than it is to adhere to the actual teachings of the Bible about God. Uh, you know, so he, 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 he'd be a little more, he's not a pure academic. Um, he's pragmatic. He is very pragmatic. And he, the pragmatic that he wants is a life of full of richness and spirituality and creativity and interconnectedness and service and love and grace. And you live that in a community and, I mean, low, he may not have believed that the Book of Mormon was historical. It's hard to tell, really. But you read his writings on the Book of Mormon, and, and the themes that he's pulling out from it are all those very good, good works kind of themes. And just a great guy to be around. You liked being around Will Benyon. Uh, my heroes, I guess, are more of the people who were more, who did more for people and building the organization than um, than the writings, like Leonard Darrington. He's a, he's a first-rate booster of people. He believed in the careful, thoughtful study of history and of Sunstone and, and of Mormonism. And, um, and he'd encourage people to do that all the time. Every year, when we sent out the symposium flyer, the first registration for the symposium that came back was Leonard Darrington's. I mean, and he did that so intentionally. It wasn't just that he was was, you know, a type A person who always had to take care of those things immediately. I think he wanted to make the point that I'm supporting you and I'm there with you. And it was such a joy to get Leonard's uh, uh, registration in the mail. And he'd always write letters encouraging people to do things. And if you asked him to do something, he was very willing to help. Once I asked him to review a book, and he said, let me think for a moment. And then he said, I don't think I can review that book. He says, because... I think I would have to give it a bad review. And it wouldn't be very helpful for that person to have a bad review from Leonard Arrington because of his position in the society. You know, he says, other people could give him a bad review and that'd be fine. But Leonard re would really use his position to try to bo boast people up and, uh, and, in and encourage the, cult the, the growth of other intellectuals. He was just a great guy. And... Uh, um, how about a couple of women? 
I mean, the next woman I was going to say was Esther Peterson, but she didn't have a lot to do with sunstone, but, so it's probably not the kind of person you want. Levina Fielding Anderson is just a wonder. You know, she's also just this fomenter and this organizer who is loving and gracious and kind and fun to be with. You know, she's passionate and she's caring. And, um, you know, that is the biggest tragedy of excommunications, is Levina. She's such a true believer. And, and despite what the church saw as these criticisms of her, that they couldn't see her, her really good-hearted motivations behind that is it's very, very, very sad. Uh, she's incredible. Peggy Fletcher, of course, is just a god to me. I, I love Peggy with all my heart. And, um, and it was her passionate idealism who, um, that came through. She had this vision and she wanted to do it, and she would push for it and push for it, and, and she'd get all these rich men, people who like to be involved in the cause and stuff, and, um, and uh, to support it, but she really cared about ideas and consequences. She's a little cause fighter from the 60s, and Mormon scholarship became uh, her cause. She, she was terrific. How about the, uh, who represents um, history, sort of the historian, the archetypal historian for what do you think uh, uh, emerging historians should strive for? Or uh, one or two, I mean, you don't have to say the, but is there anyone you could lift as, as saying their history was, was something that you think was exemplary, their approach or their rigor? Well, I'm, I'm a big fan of Jan Ships, who's a great personal friend, and who I got to know through Sunstone and other things. I like Jan because she is one of the few people who really take the big picture. And um, most of her, I think her greatest work is not yet published. It's her her work in progress on the 20th, the church in the late 20th century, post-World War II church. But she really gets Mormonism on the big picture, whereas most Mormon history is about a person, a biography, or about a time period, and they get involved in little details. Jan just has a huge scope, of, and she really can get inside of what is happening? Why are we doing correlation? What is the difference between correlation and just administrative reform? And yet they're all leaped, lumped together. And she really can sort out what's happening in Mormonism better than anyone I know. Um, she's incredible. Um, I think Mormonism, Mormon history, the writing of Mormon history, for the most part, has been pretty insular and parochial. Sometimes it's very excellent scholarship, but it's written by and for Mormons. Um, so I respect the people who are trying to write for a non-Mormon audience as well as a Mormon audience, like Kathleen Flake, I think. is. She came late to Mormon history in her career. I think she really has great promise. And um, 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 I lament that Ron Walker was not able to write his multi-volume biography of Hubert Grant. Um, um, he, he's a great storyteller, and those early chapters that he gave at MHA, and pub, at least one was published in Sunstone during Peggy's years, were, were great. What happened to it? Well, the archives were closed, and he couldn't read the grant correspondence or manuscripts or co collection anymore. So it basically ended the research. Yeah, he had to stop researching. Yeah.